we'll never know the extent of the love of God till we're gone from this place. Amen. Just like I preached this morning, we'll never know the suffering that Christ went through spiritually and in his soul until we go to the presence of the Lord. Turn to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12 with me this morning, this evening please. 2 Samuel 12 and verse number 24. We're going to talk about Solomon tonight. There's a lot of difference between Solomon and Abraham. 2 Samuel chapter number 12 and verse number 24. And David comforted Bathsheba his wife and went in unto her and lay with her and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon and the Lord loved him. Father, bless your holy word now and give me wisdom in the scripture and the message for this hour. In thy name we pray, amen. That's quite remarkable when you consider where Bathsheba came from because she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And you understand the circumstances surrounding how that came to pass. Uriah wound up carrying his own death warrant to the battlefield. Uriah was an honorable, honorable man. And David was a treacherous, treacherous villain in that affair. And but he wound up with Bathsheba as his wife. The son that was born, Nathan said, God laid the judgment on that child. And the child died. And then the Bible says, as you just read it here, he went into Bathsheba, comforted her, and she bore Solomon. And the Bible said God loved him. Nobody could have started any better than Solomon. Solomon had everything that it took to be very successful, no question about it. He was a very, very wise man because God gave him the wisdom. He had riches beyond belief. He had an army and a navy. He had things that people in those days would love to have had. And <coughs> none of these things could keep him where he needed to be with the Lord. In the book of 1 Kings chapter number 2 and verse number 12, <coughs> First Kings chapter number 2 and verse number 12, the Word of God says, Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. David was the warrior. He wanted to build a house to God, but God said, No, you, you, shed, <coughs> you shed the blood of war, and therefore a warrior, and you can't do it. But he gave him the plans for the temple, and he gave them to David and the preparation. David was a good friend of Hiram, the king of, of uh, Lebanon, and he had the cedars of Lebanon. He had the, everything that was necessary to build the temple, but God wouldn't let him do it. And so Solomon is the one who wound up building the temple of the Lord. But it was all handed to him. A kingdom was handed to Solomon that was in peace, a kingdom that was unified. Israel never knew a moment of unity like they did under David. David was the only king that Israel ever had that could unify all 12 tribes together. Go back and read the history of Israel and you'll find that every last one of them after David, they all split up. They had civil wars. They were fighting among themselves. But under David, Israel enjoyed peace from Dan to Beersheba and they were all united together as one tribe and one people under David. The reason for that is because David is a type of Christ. In the Old Testament, there's so many things about David that are just like our Lord Jesus Christ. His throne is perpetual. God raised him up as a shepherd. He knew from youth, he knew what it took to defend the sheep. And David was one, the Bible says, when, when, uh, when, uh, when the prophet uh, uh, Samuel walked into the presence of Jesse, and Jesse marched all of his big brothers, the elder brothers, before, before uh, Samuel. Samuel said, surely the anointed of the Lord is standing before me because he looked at his outward appearance. He was tall. Uh, he no doubt probably handsome, rugged looking. Uh, he played every part of the leader. He looked exactly like what they needed. But here's what God said about him. Neither have I accepted this. <laughs> that's, quite a, that's quite a put down. He didn't even say this man. He just simply said, neither have I accepted this. But uh, he said to Jesse, do you have any more sons? And Jesse said, I got a little boy out in the field. I mean, he's just a little boy out there. He's taking care of the sheep. And uh, Samuel said, call him. And they brought him in. And when they brought him in, God said, that's the one. 
And he anointed him right there, right then and right there. He anointed him as the king of Israel. At that very moment, the little shepherd boy that came out of the field. The big difference between David and Solomon is this. They were both sinners. And David's sins, no doubt, hurt a lot of people. But his sins were sins of the flesh. They were sins of lust and sins of passion and sins that have to do with the, the sins that everybody commits in one form and one degree or another. But the sins of Solomon go much deeper than that because the sins of Solomon were the things that brought in idolatry into Israel and child sacrifice into Israel and sodomites into the temple of God and every vile and corrupt thing that's imaginable. When Solomon made alliances with all of the women about that turned his heart from God, he brought that in. And once he brought that in, even though he was dead and gone, it stayed in Israel. As a matter of fact, in the remnants, it never left Israel. It was there until Israel was carried off into Babylonian captivity. So they paid deeply for that. But God raised him up. And God raised him up and the Bible said he loved him. He cast his love upon Solomon. He chose him and set him aside. And what I see in this is the great potential that God had for Solomon. What God would have done with him is beyond imagination. For he handed him a kingdom, as I say, David handed him a kingdom. And he handed him riches. He handed him all of this. And all Solomon had to do was to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, if you'll follow me, if you'll obey me, if you'll keep my commandments, he said, you haven't even begun to see what I'll do for you. I will bless you beyond measure. And for a while he did. Here in the beginning, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter number 3 and verse number 5, when he saw the enormous responsibility that was cast upon him, and anybody that's got any sense in a position of leadership they should realize that there is an enormous responsibility cast upon them. You've seen it right here and then recently in the last few days with this snowstorm that has come through. These mayors and these governors are stepping forward. They're trying to save lives. They're taking the responsibility that they should as, as, as the government leaders. That's what they're supposed to do. Shoulder that responsibility. They don't pass it off on someone else. If someone's going to be a leader, they're going to have to say as Harry Truman did, the buck stops here. That's what he said. He had, that, he had that on his desk. He said, the buck stops here. And Truman meant it. And that's what you're going to have to do in, in the position of leadership. God may have a leadership position for you. He may have you set aside right now and grooming you for the day when you become a leader. And God uses you to lead men and to lead women. Leadership is a gift from God. And it's something that is nourished in the soul. It can't be bought and it can't be sold. And you can't, you can't make a leader out of someone who's not a leader. But God can give you the gift of leadership. That can come from the Lord. And so with Solomon, when he saw all of this responsibility before him, he cried out to God. And in verse number 5 of 1 Kings chapter 3 in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Boy, what a remarkable thing. Has God ever said that to you? Ask what I shall give thee. Does God speak to you? I know a lot of people, they think that's crazy. I mean, you think God talks to you. You must be some nut job from, uh, from an independent Baptist church. Well, God does speak to you. God does speak to you. He spoke to me in my darkness and called me out of it and saved my soul, 1973. I pray to God all the time, folks. I pray to him about things. Lord, should I do this? Should I make this? Should I make this move? Should I, should I acquire this? Should I, what, what do you want me to do? I ask for leadership. I ask for direction for God to show me what his will is in certain things. I've learned from experience to not just be rambunctious and full of zeal and just think because you want to do it that God's in it. That's not necessarily so. And so I've learned to pray. Well, here's what Solomon said. And what a test he put him to. Here's the leadership ability. It's deep in his soul, folks. He's born with it. Solomon is a leader, definitely, no question about it. Here's what he says to God in verse number 6. Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I'm but a little child. That's true humility. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. 
boy. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? I would that ever president, I would that ever prime minister, I would that ever king, ever queen, I would that ever uh, a mayor and governor, I would that ever senator, I would that ever house of representatives, I would that anyone in this nation that's any position of leadership would take the same attitude. I'm in a place of responsibility. People are trusting in me. I make decisions that affect their lives. God, give me wisdom. And notice how God responds to it. And the speech pleased the Lord that Sodom had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Watch this now. Here's the way God does things. Behold, I have done according to thy words. <laughs> Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Man. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. See this? Both riches and honor. So that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Now the condition. If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And then Solomon awoke. Boy, you talk about something that is life-changing and profound. What God just said to Solomon is, I'm going to make you a leader. I'm going to make you a leader like they've never had before. I'm going to give you the wisdom necessary to make the decisions that will make Israel prosper. And because you ask of me something that is unselfish, selfless, that you ask of me so that you could do for someone else, I am also going to do this for you. God has blessed me. Has he blessed you? I did not ask God for riches. I'm not a rich man when it comes to money in this world. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Every stick that I own, every, every, every thing, everything that I wear on my back, thread, every. Everything I drive, I eat, I bow my head and I say, thank you, Lord. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. God's a good God. He's been good to me, folks. He's been good to me. You see, God will take care of the things that are peripheral. These are peripheral things. You may pile the money up around you, but you've lost the main thing. And so many people in this world think a pile of money is the main thing. No, dear friend, it's a peripheral thing. The main thing, which we'll get into in just a few minutes, is what you should be living for. You should be setting your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. You should learn the value of what's really valuable. You should learn what priorities about, are about. What matters in this life? Really, what really matters in this life? Is a human being more important than a thing? Absolutely. Are these children that you hold in your hands tonight, these precious little babies, are they more important than your, uh, than your immediate self-gratification? Uh, self uh, when you want to go out and find yourself? When we live in this me generation that wants to walk out the door and say, well, you know, I'm not going to be tied down to a, to, to a child, uh, uh, to, to payments for children and, and to a home. I want to do my thing. Well, do your thing and you'll scar your soul. And you'll scar your soul to a point to where one day you'll be one of the most miserable wretches on the face of this earth. It'll be unbelievable at how miserable you'll be. God put things in this world that give us happiness. He's given us things in this world that matter. Things that make all the difference in the world in our lives. Have you ever seen someone that come down to the end of their life and they don't have a friend in the world? Have you ever seen anybody come down to the end of their life and nobody comes to visit them? Nobody cares if they live or die? There's nobody around. That's a miserable situation to be in, is it not? It makes you wonder where they invested their life. Where did they pour their life? What, what did they pour it into? You know, you read the obituary and it says he was an avid golfer. There's nothing wrong with golf. He was an avid fisherman, all right? He was an avid hunter. He was an avid this, an avid that. These are all fine. There's nothing wrong with these things. But is that what your life is about? Is if that's what your life is about, 
When you come down to the end of your life, those fish won't be standing there. The deer won't make it to visit you. The stuff that you poured your life into won't be there. It'll be the most important things on this earth that you've missed. And the sad thing is that it is too late to do anything about it when you've got to that point. But I don't think anybody's at that point tonight. I don't think you're at that point tonight. I think you're at a point tonight where you can do something about your life and make a change in it if you need to. You can pour your life into the life of a human being. You can pour your life into the ministry of Christ. You can pour your life into things that matter. Why does it go? Tis but one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for will last. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is for. One of the reasons it's for that is that, what you've done for him. So he asked wisdom of God. In 1 Kings chapter number 5 and verse number 1, he builds the temple. We're not going to read all these scriptures tonight. It takes much time. But just to give you a kind of a chronological survey of the life of Solomon, he builds the temple. And one of the most beautiful things about the building of the temple is what happens when he gets it built. 1 Kings chapter number 8 and verse number 10. 1 Kings 8, 10. It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud, that's the cloud of glory, filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Kind of gives you an idea of what it will be like in heaven. I've heard preachers say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to preach all over the place. I ain't going to preach to me. I've done my preaching here. I'm finished. <laughs> when I leave this old world, I've preached my last message. No need to preach up there. You see, there's no need to minister when the glory has come down. And here the glory came down and they couldn't minister. Notice carefully, the glory drove them out of the temple. See that? And when you get into, when you go to glory, into the presence of the Lord, nobody's going to be up there preaching. There's no ministering up there because you got the minister. <laughs> there you got Christ. You got the living bread. You got the fountain of living water. Hallelujah. You got the light. You got it all there. And when you get to glory, that'll all be yours. Hallelujah to God. So the glory, the glory trumps the ministry. Notice carefully. The glory is more powerful and more important and primary to the ministry. And sometimes people are so, you know, I've, have you ever seen churches where the people look like they're all in a straitjacket? Scared to death to say amen. You know, what are people going to think about me? Who cares? If you knew what they thought about you right now, you, you wouldn't want to You wouldn't want to know. I mean, after all, if you base your relationship with God and your life on what people think about you, then you're going to be a miserable person indeed. Amen. I don't want people to think ill of me. I don't want them to think bad of me. I don't intentionally want to make people mad at me, cross people and treat them bad or go wrong with people. But folks, the Word of God and the ministry that I'm in, this calling on my life is far more important to me than whether some group likes me or not. That's the way it ought to be with you. It ought to be that way with you, that your place with God and what He's called you to do. Now I want you to notice what it says over here in 2 Chronicles 6.1. This is beautiful. 2 Chronicles 6.1, talking about this glory. If you look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 5, to kind of give you an idea of First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, for the most part, are talking about the same thing. Sometimes they give a little different perspective, but it's talking about the same thing. And over here in Second Chronicles, chapter number five, and verse number fourteen, it says, "So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God." Look at verse six, verse one, chapter six. Then said Solomon. The Lord hath said to me, the Lord hath said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Now think about that for a minute. The thick darkness, he dwells in it. Isn't that an amazing thing? So what does that mean, preacher? That means that he dwells in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen. You see, he's the light, but you have to be there where you can see the light. And you're not there yet. 
And that Bible says that we behold the face of Christ and we behold the glory of Christ, unlike Moses where the glory faded away. We have that glory today that's on our soul and that's an eternal glory. But the light is a different thing. In Hebrews chapter number 1, the light that shines out of the invisible God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the light. And we see that light, but we don't see the invisible God. Here in the book of, of, uh, book of Chronicles, it's talking about this darkness that he dwells in. Does God dwell in darkness? He dwells in darkness in the sense that you can't see him. It's pitch dark. And unless you're where you can see the light, you never will see the light. If you're born again tonight, if you are really born again tonight, you'll see the light that this world has never seen. It's not light that lightens physical things. It's light that illumines the soul. It's the light of God shining forth upon his creation. We'll see that light one day, for we'll see him as he is. So we find here in the book of 1 Kings chapter number 10 that the queen of Sheba visits him. His renown, his, uh, his uh, uh, reputation had spread all over the place. And 1 Kings chapter number 10, the queen of Sheba comes a long way to see for herself what she'd been hearing about. <coughs> and when she gets there, I want you to notice in verse number 7, I won't read all of this. And when you get home, you can. Start reading in chapter, 1 Kings 10, 1, and read all of that. It's beautiful. But look at verse number 7. Here's what the queen of Sheba says, 1 Kings 10, 7. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. That's straight from the scripture. How many of you have ever heard somebody say the half hasn't been told? How many of them do you think know that came straight out of a King James Bible? That's part of our culture. That's part of our language. I heard that all of my life growing up. The half hasn't been told. That came straight out of the Bible. The Queen of Sheba said it. And she said it because she was overwhelmed with the attendance, the singing, the money, the position as he entered, as he approached the Temple Mount, as he walked into the temple and all that went on, 5,000 voice choir, all of this that happened. She was overwhelmed with it. And it literally blew her away. And she saw that and she says, the half has not been told. Whatever I heard, it doesn't even compare with what my eyes are seeing. I'm telling you right now, folks, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things the Lord has in store for those that love him. You can't put it in words. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I saw things unspeakable, unlawful. He said, God wouldn't let me say it. If he, did, if I, he, said, if God, he, said, he said, if I said it, then I'd be going home immediately. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. God said, now, Paul, I'm giving you a privilege. I'm going to let you look into the world to come. I'm going to let you look where mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and husbands and wives are reunited. I'm going to let you see it. I'm going to let you see them where they're singing the redeemed around the throne of God. I'm going to let you sense what's going on in heaven. A beautiful, beautiful place. Now, Paul, get a good look at it. Look at what you're, take it in. Now, the apostle looked at that and said, my goodness gracious, ha, my, let me go back and tell people about this. It's like the rich man, you remember? In hell, he said, let me go back and tell my brethren and warn them about this horrible place. They'll believe me. And, and, and Abraham said, no, they've got Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe them, they won't believe you. If one even came back from the dead. And so the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 said this, God showed me things that were unlawful for me to tell you about. I've often wondered about it. I really have because I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Whatever Paul, whatever God showed Paul is not in Revelation. Whatever he showed him is not in, Revel, in, not in revealed scripture. See, it's nowhere in the Bible. Whatever God showed the apostle Paul blew him away. And he said, I, was in a, I knew a man in Christ and I saw it. And so when the queen of Sheba says the half has not been told, it hadn't been told. And you can't tell till you're there until you see it. And so the apostle Paul said, I hath not seen Ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him. When D.L. Moody left this world, 
He lifted his head toward heaven, raised his hands and said, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. Look at this. This is it. And he left that bed just like that. <laughs> he did. That's how he left. This is it. Hallelujah. Shouting and praising God. And away Dwight L. Moody left. Hallelujah. There ain't no better way to leave than that, I don't think, do you? <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. The Bible said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen. Amen. The righteous does not die like the wicked. There's two entirely different things going on there. They don't die the same. Amen. But in 1 Kings chapter number 11, we see his downfall. He married and took in many different wives. He took in all these pagans around him and their gods. And when he took them in and their gods, the Bible says in verse number 4, 1 Kings 11, For it came to pass when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now this brings us to the chronology of Solomon, his life. His life as it's laid out. Where do we find ourselves in the life of Solomon? Solomon started well. He started blessed of God. He started with the gift of God. He started as a leader. Solomon started with everything that anybody would ever want to have. He had it all. He had everything that you could possibly desire in this world. Solomon had it all, but he squandered it. He squandered it because he took in women. Why did he do that? Because he yielded to his lust. He had a problem with the flesh. And as you know, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. There's not a one of you that would invite Solomon into a marriage seminar. There's not a one of you that would let your wife uh, uh, get anywhere around Solomon. If you're smart, you wouldn't. He was literally obsessed with that. No question about it. Yet God endured it. Just like he endured David and his concubines. Just like, and the Bible said, you remember that David walked before the Lord. But you know, David repented before the Lord too. In the book, of, in the Psalms, it said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Look in the Bible for the places where you find where people repent and they get right with God. It's a beautiful thing when you see how that God forgives puts it aside, and then continues to bless. That's a marvelous thing. Have you ever really thought about the 11th chapter of Hebrews in this great hall of faith, all these people in here, all these names, starting with Adam and going all the way through them? Have you thought about them? There's not a one of them that's perfect. Yet God includes them in the great hall of faith. God wants to bless you. He wants to see you in the right light. His thoughts toward you are good. If you only knew his thoughts for you, what he wants to do with your life, and all he asks of you is that you come humbly before him and be willing to receive and acknowledge your weakness and your need for what he's provided for you. The provision that God has given to every one of us is the provision of grace. Everything that God will bless you with spiritually comes by grace. What does that mean? That means it can't be bought. It can't be earned. And it's not given to you by the hands of a man. It comes from God in the channel of grace. Therefore, it can be received freely. And that's why he said, freely you have received, freely give. By grace. Grace. The unmerited gift and favor of God. How many of you tonight would like to have God bless you like that? I would. I want God to bless my life. I want God's hand on my life. I want to know what got that back door out there. I want to know God Almighty sits down next to me in the seat of that car. <laughs> he needs to. <laughs> Amen. Uh, <laughs> got some glasses the other day, and my wife said, you drove better before you got the glasses. <laughs> <clears throat> it's awful to get old and feeble. Amen. The body begins to wear away. As he says in Ecclesiastes, the grinders, the teeth grind down, the eyes, the window shades begin to dim and close. And all of that begins to happen. And I don't care how much of an athlete you are and how strong and rambunctious you are, I used to be too. 
uh, it, time will take its toll. So what do you do? You just glorify God and say, hallelujah, this old body's here today and it's gone tomorrow. I'm not my body. Amen? Amen. That's what you do. Now I'm going to come to a close tonight by talking about something. I don't want to be too hard on Solomon. Because Solomon, I believe, with all my heart went to heaven. No question about that. But Solomon paid a dear price for what he did. And Israel paid a dear price for what Solomon did. But Solomon wrote scripture. That's a privilege to write scripture. Solomon wrote three books. He didn't write the whole book of Proverbs, but many of the Proverbs are the Proverbs of Solomon. He wrote the book of the Song of Solomon, and he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. These are three books that were penned by Solomon. These three books represent stages in the life of Solomon. They're important because they open up a window into his heart. They show you what Solomon was thinking and how he felt about God. Over there in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter number 2 and verse number 4, I believe this is the first book he ever wrote. Song of Solomon 2 and verse 4. He says, He brought me to the banqueting, banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Solomon and the Shulamite picture Christ and his bride. Solomon, therefore, becomes a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's quite an honor, don't you think? And he wrote the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon gives you different perspectives on love in the way God sees it and the way a human being responds to it. It's remarkable when you look at the way God sees love and the way man responds to it. Here, she says, his banner over me is love. You see, Solomon was full of love when he first started. It wasn't fleshly love. It wasn't lust. It was love. That's the strongest thing that I know of in this world, love. It's a powerful thing. You will do things if you truly love. You will do things that you could never be, never be to coerced or any other way to do except out of love. You will hazard your life if you truly love. You'll lay down your life if there's real love there. No greater love, the Bible said, does a man have than this. Then he'll do what? He lay down his life for his friends. The Apostle John says in the book of 1 John, here in his love, that we should die for our brethren. Boy, you see much of that lately? That's a powerful thing. That's what the Song of Solomon is about. So Solomon started in the first part of his life, he was full of the love of God. Notice carefully, the Bible said the Lord loved him. Remember? The Lord loved him. If you really get a hold of the fact that the Lord loves you and you don't deserve it and you don't earn it and you're not, you know, there's nothing about you lovable, but you do get a hold of that fact, unless you are an absolute pervert, you will, ref you will return that love to him. Because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Now the second part of Solomon's life is found over here in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 1, verse 1. Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1. I'll just use this as an example. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, and notice carefully, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Well, now these words are the kind of words that come from a man that's been given wisdom, right? God gave him wisdom. God gave Solomon wisdom. God said to Solomon, he said, there's been none before you, there'll be none after you that have the wisdom that I'm going to give you. Solomon had that wisdom. He had it in his heart. And he's trying to say to you, God gave me something that'll make all the difference in your life. The book of Proverbs continues on and, 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 and it has illustration after illustration. Here's bottom line. Every choice you make has ramifications. The younger you are, the faster you'll make choices without thinking about what it's going to do to you. Amen? You'll never give a thought to it. As you get older and you've been bitten a few times, been burned a few times, then you'll stop and think before you make some of these decisions, right? That's wisdom. And so the book of Proverbs bases all of its teaching on wisdom, to know wisdom. Well, Solomon had that wisdom. What happened to him? I've often wondered about that. What happened to Solomon? 
What happened to him to cause him, a man with the wisdom he had, he knew God was the only God there was. He knew to serve him was to be blessed of God. He knew that, and yet he still allowed himself to be sucked into these pagan religions. And the Bible says that when he was old, his heart, his heart was turned away from God, which brings up an enigma, and it's this one. The last book that Solomon wrote was the book of Ecclesiastes. All right, the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher. And look what he says over here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1 and verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Israel, or king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word translated vanity is the Hebrew word hevel. And that word means empty and unsatisfactory. In plainer words, it does not satisfy. And I've never met anybody, I don't reckon, in my lifetime that ever went to the extent, to the degree that Solomon went to. He did it all. And he said, I was left empty and broken. So I guess one of the greatest truths you can learn from the life of Solomon is that Solomon says, I've tried it. God said, don't do it. I tried it anyway. God said, it's wrong, but I did it. I did it my way. You remember the song? I did it my way. And after I did it, I realized that God told me right to begin with and the wisdom with, was with God. But I had already passed the point to where that would not give me comfort and solace in my soul. And so therefore, I was a man who was living in a vain world, empty world. I hope your life's not empty tonight. Pour your life into your children. Pour your life into your family. Pour your life into your service for the Lord. Pour your life into your faith. Pour your life into the things that will return to you later in life. Pour it into the stuff that matters don't pour it into running with your buddies. There's nothing wrong with running with your buddies, but that's all some people live for. Don't pour it into sports. There's nothing wrong with sports, but that's all some people live for. In other words, don't fill your life full of temporal, vain things. And that's how Satan has gotten this nation. We've got a nation full of people who live for empty, vain things. That's why they have to be constantly pumped up some new thing, gadget, whatever, because they have no root. There's no foundation. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, with, with basis to them. They're just, they're just flying here, flipping here, married today, gone to somebody else tomorrow, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Nobody's happy. Vain thing. Life should not be that way. Just the other day, they had the lottery and it had reached uh, I forget now already uh, what was it uh, 1.6 billion dollars I believe it was supposed to be the largest lottery in history and then we had some winners and it was a groups of people broken up I don't remember how many people were involved in it but a number of people won the lottery but it showed people standing in line for hours long lines so that they could buy lottery tickets. Why? Because they felt like if they, if they hit the lottery or won the lottery, it was going to bring them happiness. It was, going to bring, it was going to just absolutely take care of all their problems. That money would be the answer. And then I heard one say, if you're not happy now, you won't be happy if you hit the lottery. Let me give you a few cases tonight. One woman won a $10 million lottery. Nine years later, she's living paycheck to paycheck. $10 million. Another one won a lottery for $2.76 million. It cost her her marriage. Her home wound up being broken up. Isn't it strange how money can bring out the worst in us? Isn't it remarkable how the Bible says the love of is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of it. It brings something out of people. 5.4 million 
was gambled away in Atlantic City, and the individual now lives in a trailer park. $5.4 million. Here's one that had $15 million, lived in the fast lane, cocaine, parties, hookers, cars, for five years. Now, all of his money is gone, and he wants his old job back as a garbage collector. He had $15 million. <coughs> you could preach an entire message about what money cannot do for you, but what money will do to you. You can get your eyes on this, and you can think about what Satan said to the Lord Jesus. Look at all that. Here are the kingdoms of the world. Look at all this power, riches. He said, I can give it to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. What did the Lord Jesus say to him? What's that? It's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve, right? Satan said, turn these stones to bread. The Lord Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. For everything Satan said to him, the Lord Jesus Christ countered with the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is our living food that sustains us and feeds us. Would you give up your Bible, never be able to read it again, never be able to go to church again, never be able to pray again, never be able to stand up and sing the songs of Zion Fellowship with God's people for a million dollars? You see, that million dollars would go sooner or later, and there you'd be left. And we have a man right now. He's worth, it's my understanding, my granddaughter told me today, his name is Bloomberg. He's either worth $32,000 million or $37,000 million. All right? That's $37 billion with a B or $32 billion. I forget which one it is. All right? That's a pile of money. He says that he's thinking about running for president and that he's willing to spend a billion, a thousand million dollars. He's willing to spend that as he runs for president. All right? God help us. I'm going to tell you, you better do some praying about that. <laughs> now, here's the point. He's not a happy man, is he? No. No, he's not happy. No. You see, once, you're, once the money loses its, its, uh, its appeal, then what's next? Power. You got that right. Power. Power. And so the, Satan wrapped it all up together and said, here are the kingdoms of the world, the riches that go with it. I can give it to whomsoever I will. I'll give it to you. In other words, he offered him riches and money. Remember what Solomon said? Lord, it's not about riches. It's not about money. Just give me wisdom that I can lead my people. All right, turn to this scripture tonight. This will be the last one we read. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 9. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He had to come down give up the glory of heaven, give up the throne, give up all of the majesty and the greatness that was his by nature, and take upon himself a body of flesh, live in this world, suffer in this world, bleed in this world, die in this world. The Son of Man hath, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. And so he'd had nothing in this world, all right? But the fact that he did that when he came down and God incarnated himself in flesh. All the riches of heaven are now ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God has for us in the future will come through the Son of God. And it was all his. And he earned it. And he earned it by obedience to the Father. 
And now because of his poverty, we can be made rich. That's riches. That's something tonight that money cannot buy. God saved me. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm not selling that. I'm not exchanging that. That's mine forever. Amen. And you may be worth $32,000 million. You may, Bill Gates is at one time he, and this is, listen folks, at one time, Bill Gates was worth $90,000 million. $90 billion. He was worth that at one time. I don't know, he's fallen on hard times. I think he's down to about 65 or 70 billion now. <laughs> you know, he fluctuates up and down. But think about it. Think about it. I wouldn't sell my relationship with God, the eternity of my soul, and where I know I'm going when I leave this world for $90,000 million, folks. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And that is available for you tonight if you simply ask him. <coughs> God will give you that gift and you can become rich beyond measure. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen. Amen. <coughs>